I personally went down to the helipad and looked at all the wounded, and there was quite a few, quite a few. Out of 126 individuals, we probably had either killed or wounded probably 45, 50 individuals. My name is Gil Perez, I'm 75 years old and a resident of Pico Rivera. Today I'm going to tell you my personal experience of a Memorial Day event that occurred in 1968. It wasn't a Memorial Day event, but the circumstances of that day are now etched in my brain and reminded not only every day, but especially on Memorial Day. I'm going to talk to about you about a friend that I knew very shortly, or for a small amount of time, but he was killed while I was in Vietnam. When my team went up there uh, to Nui Ba Din, we had all our supplies. We brought our own food, we brought our radio, we brought our equipment, we brought our weapons, we brought our ammunition, because our unit was only one small unit within the 25th Division of thousands and thousands of soldiers. Our unit consisted of LERP teams, which usually five, six-man units that would go out into the jungle for different reasons, gather intelligence, um, see if their enemy was moving in what direction. The teams would go out there for four, four or five days until uh, and depending on the circumstances. And because they were somewhat distant from the main base, they would send us, the radio operators, to relay communications, keep awake 24 hours, have somebody man the radios 24 hours a day. So the mission was to go to Nui Baden, set up, and get ready to help the LERP teams who were supposed to be inserted. But because the weather was very bad, um, it wasn't clear. There was a lot of fog, a lot of uh, rain, different times. Uh, the teams were not going to be inserted because no support. They, if they needed help, they'd have to call in helicopters. And because of the bad weather, um, they weren't going to be inserted. We were up there for three or four days. Uh, I was losing patience because we weren't doing anything, and I called the lieutenant who was in charge of the operation and told him, and he says, just hang in there, hang in there, we're gonna, we're gonna have an insertion. And then two days before, the 11th, to the best of my knowledge, um, I was approached by an individual, it turned out to be Wayne, he says, my name's Wayne, I'm here to be part of the team and um, you're supposed to train me into what we're gonna be doing. I said, okay, I said, first of all, find a nice place to sleep because we don't have any assigned places to sleep, you just have to find your own place. And he went about his business, but I told him and the other folks because I didn't feel comfortable being up there, I was, and to this day, I try to think to be prepared for no matter what. That was a valuable lesson because prophecy, I guess, that I told my men that if something happened, where to go, what to do, be prepared. Don't count on anybody, count on yourself. And when that happened, uh, the day before, two days before, when that night that Wayne arrived, he had got into a card game and he proudly showed me his brand new watch. And he said he wanted it in a card game. I said, oh, good for you. Okay, and that was it. Uh, that was the last conversation I had with him. In 1968, I was assigned to a reconnaissance team, long range reconnaissance patrol from the 25th Division out of Coochie, Vietnam. On May the 13th, I led a team of communications operators, radio operators, to a mountaintop called Nui Ba Din, 3,200 feet high. 
in the middle of rice paddies, the highest mountain in the southern part of Vietnam or the South Vietnam. On May the 13th, we got attacked on this hill, this mountain. Uh, I had gone to sleep. I had told the, my team the day before that if anything happens, if we get attacked, that we would have a meet together in the pagoda, which was a religious Buddhist temple at the top of the hill. The American communications team that was up there, over 126 individuals, uh, in my opinion, weren't prepared for an attack. It never happened up there uh, on that mountain. They had never been attacked. They had never been fired upon until May the 13th. May 13th at around 9.45, 10 o'clock at night, while everybody was asleep, or supposedly, we were attacked and woken up by satchel charges, rifle grenades. Subsequently, we were, I could tell that we were being overrun, that our men, troops up there, were doing the best they could, but unfortunately, we were surprised and we were Many men were wounded, many men were dying. I was hearing, hearing a lot of screaming, yelling, uh, not knowing where these were at because I was basically sleeping in an ammunition dump, which was not a good idea at the time, but I was able to escape from that um, bunker and made my way uh, to the pagoda I took a position along the wall, which was about two and a half, three feet high of concrete, and uh, prepared myself to repel the enemy who were surrounding the mountain, the pagoda. Uh, shortly, at some point, uh, a, a lieutenant came behind me and tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, there's a wounded individual at the back of the pagoda, uh, he tapped two other individuals next to me and told them to carry a stretcher. And I was gonna lead them to help find where this individual was. I led the two individuals who were carrying the stretcher, we were low crawling to the back of the pagoda. And after about 15, 20 yards, I looked behind me to make sure everything was okay. And the, there was only one individual carrying the stretcher. And so I continued moving along, and another 20 yards I looked back and just the stretcher was there, there was nobody else. I don't know what happened to those individuals. So I kept on my mission and I got to the back of the pagoda and there were large rocks uh, protruding from the ground, probably 10, 15 feet high. Uh, they looked like giant surfboards stuck in the ground but they were dark, black, uh, very unusual terrain. Uh, it was pitch black. Uh, I started crawling around the rocks uh, looking for this individual. I did not see anybody. Uh, I didn't want to be there any more than they had asked me to be there, but I didn't want to be there at all. So I quickly uh, did a, a survey within my eyes without exposing myself to as best I could see, and I crawled around for maybe five minutes. Uh, eventually, I saw an individual who was sitting on, uh, on the ground with his back up against a rock. And I went up and I did a quick uh, cursory of his body. Um, I touched his face, his shoulders, his midsection his legs, his feet. I didn't see or observe or feel any uh, wounds or blood or injuries. And when I got to his wrist, I saw that he had a watch. That watch I recognized as this individual who had just came into our unit, who was a brand new individual. He, had sent, he was sent up the day before to 
get trained by me and our team. And I recognized the watch because he had won the watch in a poker game that day before, and he was proud of his winnings, and he showed it to me. And so when I saw the watch, I, rec I knew who it was without really focusing on who, who he was. So not feeling any injuries in my mind, he was unconscious but still alive. I didn't feel for a heartbeat or check his wrist for a pulse. I just started back to the pagoda where they had a makeshift first aid station for the wounded and the dead. I pulled him by his jacket collar, drug him back to the pagoda, and I went inside the pagoda. I left him at the doorway, and I told the medics to please take care of him. I felt responsible, but there was, things were going happening fast, and I needed to get back to help stem the tide, so to speak. So I left them there. Finally, um, things got quiet after another couple hours. We repelled uh, what was left of the Viet Cong who were, had overrun our position. When daylight broke, my first objective was to go find Wayne. And I looked around the pagoda where the medics were and I asked them, where is my guy? And they said, all the wounded were being taken down to the helipad. And that was the only way to get in and out of this top mountaintop was by helicopter. The other individuals on my team, we met uh, in front of the pagoda. I told them Wayne was missing to assign each individual area to go look for uh, Wayne in case he wasn't uh, down below at the helipad. I personally went down to the helipad and looked at all the wounded and there was quite a few, quite a few. Out of 126 individuals, we probably had either killed or wounded probably 45, 50 individuals. I looked at all the wounded individuals as best I could to see if Wayne was there. I didn't see him. I then opened up the body bags of all the dead, wounded or dead. I opened up enough to look at their face and check their wrist for a watch. None of them were Wayne. I was frustrated. I went back to the top, to the pagoda. There were people running around. There was bodies everywhere. Uh, I asked, I finally found my team. I had told them to come back in 20 minutes. They showed up. They said none of them had found him. So I says, okay, get out the radio because we need to talk to our headquarters and tell them what had happened. I went back to the helipad. Again, I started looking at all the wounded. I wanted to make sure and nothing. I went back, opened up every body bag again, and he wasn't there. My heart was breaking. I didn't know what to do. I went back to the medics and told them, Wayne's not there. We're, do you have anybody left in here? And they said, no, they're all down there. They've been taken since daybreak. So I tried to gather my senses and I knew I had to call the on the radio the captain of the unit down in Kuchi to tell him what had happened. While I was standing there, uh, an individual who knew I was looking for Wayne said, Gil, did you find him? I said, no. He says, well, 
hate to tell you this, but there's a body underneath the poncho over here on the side. It might be him. It was a dead body there, covered with a poncho. I lifted up the poncho and it was Wayne. He was dead. He had died, to the best of my knowledge, from a wound in the back that penetrated and killed him. But the the weapon or the what they used to kill him did not penetrate the front of his jacket. He had been he was blown up from the backside in and he was dead. Never knew it. We eventually got off the mountain. I was very upset. Our original mission was to support uh, LERP teams who were going to proceed from the mountaintop down looking for the Viet Cong, which were there plenty of them down uh, living inside the mountain. They had hospitals, they had caves full of ammunition, they had training, they had they had a lot of stuff in the side of the mountain. That's why we never went down there. It was very difficult to traverse. Subsequently, I made it back to Kuchi, the headquarters of the LERPs, and excuse me. We were. Uh, I didn't know Wayne that well, other than that night or that day before when he had come to come to the unit. Um, I eventually left Vietnam in December of 1968 and um, continued on with my life. Nothing was ever said about it again. It, I looked for official documentation that we were up there, but nothing was ever recorded. Uh, the way the Army operates then, it was, what have you done for us lately that we can show that we have numbers, we have facts, we have figures, you know. And since we didn't have no team insertions, we didn't have no operation other than our team. And I lost contact with all the individuals that were with me that day. And there's only one who I know that lives lives in Southern California. He's, he's local, but I haven't talked to him in 30 years. So I keep it to myself and um, I have memories, uh, but that memory will never, never be forgotten. I lived my life, put all those memories deep, deep, deep in my heart. But I always knew that I had to know something about him. I don't think he knew anybody up on that mountain other than me. I eventually determined or found out some information about him. He was from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was only 18. He had just arrived in Vietnam in March, and by May 13th, he was dead. I did everything in my power to locate his family, any living relatives, because it was many years later that I had to make peace with myself to talk to his family, to let them know what happened that night. I eventually got in contact with a Tulsa newspaper that was able to help me research and found some newspaper articles about him. I was able to find, get a picture of his gravesite in Tulsa where he was buried. And eventually found out that he was awarded a Bronze Star plus all the other awards that you get when you get there or leave Vietnam. But it still haunts me to this day. In 2017, I was able to go to Washington, D.C. on Veterans Day and pay homage to his name on the wall. 
fortunately, I had my wife who supported me and comforted me because it's very, very difficult. And now uh, I feel not any different, not any better, but it was something that will always be in my memory and my heart. Coming home was uh, a different event because I had, uh, they were offering uh, individuals with less than six months to do in the military if they wanted to extend any time in Vietnam to allow them to get home with less than six months that you can, they would discharge you from the army. And I would have to extend 12 days sometime between Christmas and uh, New Year's of 1968. And I wrote my parents and sent them a letter and told them that I was going I was going to extend so that I didn't I could when I got back to the United States I didn't have to put on the uniform again. <laughs> Not that I was ashamed of it. I just felt I needed to leave the past as best I could. <laughs> At the last day before the 12 days started, I decided I didn't want to be there anymore. I didn't want to risk my life, my limbs, my eyesight, any injuries or sacrifice anything because it would have fallen on my shoulders and my head that I volunteered to stay. I decided that it was time to come home. I was a sergeant. Uh, I was a, promoted to a sergeant position. And so I left, uh, ended up in Oakland, California. After several days there, I made my way home <clears throat> by airplane to here in Pico Rivera, where my family was. Uh, my sister picked me up at the airport, and I surprised my mother and father. <laughs> they were in shock to see me, but it was a very happy reunion. Uh, it took me months to recover from the fear of falling asleep and not knowing if I was going to wake up or backfire or a plane flying over or a helicopter or somebody throwing the fireworks that made me go deeper into myself and keep those memories deep within my soul. And I eventually put it past. I was proud to be a Vietnam, I am proud to be a Vietnam veteran, serve my country. But it took a long time for me to realize that I needed to do something about Wayne. And I hope that eventually maybe his family will see it, hear it, know that I did everything I could to take care of him, but <laughs> he didn't make it. He didn't make it. <laughs> it didn't grow up to see kids, a wife, family, a holiday. And I hope he's looking down. <sighs> I'll never forget you. administration to file claims for PTSD and compensation and benefits for my experiences there and this was probably 10 years ago that I had to talk to their doctors about what caused me to wake up in the middle of the night go screaming into the backyard A lot of things that I never really talked to about to anybody, and they 
listen to me and but that was the first time probably about 10 years ago 10 years ago that I really told anybody did never express these feelings but to my wife to nobody until recently and it still hurts it hasn't made it any better even talking about it because emotions still come up when I came back from Vietnam I, I did 30 days uh, vacation or downtime I eventually went to station to Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. I was a sergeant. Um, no other military soldier in our unit had been to Vietnam, so they were a little not real friendly to me because I think they were a little scared of me um, just because I had been through what I had gone through. Eventually, I left the military after six months at Fort Bliss. I came back to Pico Rivera. Uh, subsequently, I, after about a year and a half, I applied to the LA County Sheriff's Department and made it a career for 25 years. I worked numerous assignments, uh, met a lot of wonderful people that focused uh, on closeness and friendliness, friendship. I worked 25 years, I worked at five different patrol stations, Norwalk, Pico Rivera, East LA, Malibu, and Lakewood Sheriff Stations. I didn't want to be part of the furniture. I enjoyed my career. Uh, I eventually left them. I became a security director for three different security companies. I was in charge of the LA County Museum of Art when the Vincent Van Gogh exhibit came here in 1998. I had 300 people under my command. And it was a successful display of art. So I got to see Vincent Van Gogh's 70 pieces of art every day, which was wonderful. I eventually became, I got into real estate, I got into private investigation business. I, what else did I do? I've done so many things. I was a funeral director for two and a half years. I was a security consultant and executive protection for family from Saudi Arabia, the very high end of their family who uh, have homes in Beverly Hills. I eventually was living here in Pico Rivera with my wife. Um, I was approached, or I should say, I was in conversation with one of the city councilmen, and at that time they were talking about creating a veterans commission for the city, which I was very enthusiastic about because veterans at that time were real struggling with a lot of different things, and there was a lot of resources that they weren't aware of. Nobody gives you a book or a pamphlet how to deal with different things. Uh, I started going to the VA in Long Beach, but it was more depressing than it was helpful. Uh, so I made it my obligation to stay away from the VA if I could, if I didn't have to go there. But going back to the Veterans Commission, I saw it as a good opportunity to give back and help awareness. Um, the city is going to be having a memorial, the traveling wall here in Smith Park, Pico Vera, this next month. And my focus was on education to the young people, the school people, the high school people, the college kids, because I don't think they touch on in their history books much about what's happened in the past, especially since 1968 or the Vietnam War and I hope to enlighten some to express my experiences so they have a clear understanding of somebody who's walking and talking and still breathing and without having to read about it after I pass away.